or Rod Hachuva, we got to really, it's before Yom Kippur and it's the last class. So we got to do a lot of Truva talking today. And then Truva doing better than Truva talking. Okay, Vakasha Rabbi Shva. Okay, shalom to everybody. Gemar um, Um, Actually, today's shiur is, the idea is to, how to take the high holidays to continue throughout the rest of the year. And um, I noticed that usually, uh, you know, when you give a talk, so you have to, uh, you know, give sort of an introduction uh, for, the, for the people who come in late. I thought that on Zoom, uh, people would come on time, but uh, I found here that... Uh, Jewish time is Jewish time. No, so, we don't uh, believe in Jewish time. We start on time, and if they come late, they should feel bad that they missed oh. it. So that, those that's who came on my time, approach, and we can review. They time, can listen, but it's not fair to people who come on time. For sure, and uh, you will have gained an extra treat um, because we've been learning the writings of Rav Kook, and as an introduction to today's shiur. Um, you'll see that it's directly connected with Rav Kook's overall understanding of the world. Uh, one of the most famous uh, quotes that it was actually Rav Meir Barilan who summarized it, but Rav Kook was the one, I'll already go into the share screen so we could see it inside. And many of you uh, are familiar with the uh, slogan of the Mizrahi or of Bnei Akiva, religious Zionism, Am Yisrael Be'eretz Yisrael Al Pi Torat Yisrael. That is uh, the nation of Israel in the land of Israel, according to the Torah of Israel. And as we'll see, that is directly connected with what we're going to learn tonight. Um, and Rav Kook uh, does spell it out here. Let's look together in source number one. In Orot Yisrael, Parakei Tziyif Aleph, Yisrael ba'amim, Eretz Yisrael ba'aratzot, Torah Yisrael betorot ve'amunot kulan. The Jewish nation, Am Yisrael, among all the nations. The land of Israel, among all of the lands. The Torah of Israel, among all of the religions and ideologies. Hinam shlosham merkazim. These are the three central bases that the treasure of life and the eternal light are hidden inside these three physical things. The Torah is a physical thing. It's parchment. It teaches us what to eat and what not to eat, what to wear and what not to wear. It's a very physical Torah chayim, a living Torah. Also, Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, is a nation of flesh and blood, just like all the other nations. We have a language and uh, we have a culture. And uh, also Eretz Israel is a land, just like every nation has a land. The Jewish people have the land of Israel. But what these three physical things are really all essentially spiritual. And they have inside them the treasure of life and light. To feed to um, nourish the entire world, ma'alim umikadshim oto. These three physical things, which are also holy, and bridge the gap between the heavens and the earth, between the body and the soul. Um, we, our role of Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, and Torah Yisrael is to bring holiness to the entire world and to all of the nations. Now, the idea of this trio is uh, Rav Kook did not invent it. As you'll see, really all of Judaism is based on these three aspects, uh, this triangle. If you open up any, just about any given uh, chapter in the Tanakh, in the Bible, you'll see that uh, the situation is referring to the ideal situation. Whereas every situation as a who, a what and a where, right? I live in Kol Shachar, so I am the who. What is live? Kol Shachar is where, right? We are all learning Torah in TIM, Torah in motion. Who, what, where. Similarly, if every situation has a who, a what, and a where, that means that the ideal situation is the ideal who, 
the ideal what and the ideal where. And again, you open up the Tanakh in just about every any place, every book, and you see that the ideal who, the hero of the Tanakh, is the nation of Israel. The ideal where is the land of Israel. And the ideal what, what is Am Yisrael supposed to be doing in Eretz Yisrael? What is the Torah? That is Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, and Torah Yisrael. Uh, similarly, uh, there are three different types of Kedusha. There are three different types of holiness in the world. In Chassidut, they talk a lot about it, but it's actually found in the Zohar. Kedushat Adam, Kedushat Makom, and Kedushat Zman. The holiness of people, the holiness of place, and the holiness of time. We're here too. The holiness of people is the nation of Israel. The holiness of place is the land of Israel. And the holiness of time, how to make our time holy, how to make our lives holy, what do we do with our time? That is Torah Yisrael. Now, this triangle um, obviously has different levels as well, just like everything, right? When you go buy uh, eggs in the supermarket, right? There's grade A, jumbo, super, medium. Or if you uh, buy a ticket on an airplane, right? The travel agent will ask you, uh, First class, second class, business, coach, student, right? There are different levels of everything. So too, there are different levels of Kedusha. So among Kedushat Adam, the classic Kedushat Adam throughout the Tanakh is Kedushat Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. But even within Am Yisrael, there is a higher level of Kedusha. Among the 12 tribes, Shevet Levi has a higher level. Among Shevet Levi, the Kohanim. And among the Kohanim, there is the Kohen Gadol, who is the epitome of Kedushat Adam, the epitome of Am Yisrael. The same thing with holiness of place. Eretz Yisrael is the general holy place, but within Eretz Yisrael, we all know that Eretz Kena'an, the West Bank, is on a higher level than the East Bank. And within the West Bank, Yerushalayim is on a higher level. And within Yerushalayim, Harabite, and within Harabait, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. So that, the Kodesh, the Holy of Holies, that is the epitome of Kedushat Makom, holiness of place. The same thing with Kedushat Zaman. We have a lot of holy days, but we know that there is only one Shabbat Shabbaton, and that is Yom Kippur. And I imagine some of you pieced the triangle together where where the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, one time a year, when? On Yom Kippur. That is the meeting of the climax of all three holinesses. The climax of Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, and Torah Yisrael. Kedushat Adam, holiness of man, holiness of place, and holiness of time. Now, this is also true, not just about the national situation, also regarding the individual. I remember my uh, father's uh, bar mitzvah, they didn't have videos. What they used to do is they would make a record. Anybody is hear a record of a bar mitzvah? And uh, so they interview my father, the bar mitzvah boy, and they ask him, uh, Sheldy boy, what do, what do you want to be when you grow up? So my father answers a classic 1950s answer. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. And then you hear my grandfather whisper to him something. And then, he's, and then he adds, or an ordained rabbi. So usually that is the dream of a Jewish family. Today may be a tie tech, but the... Uh, the truer, higher level, the highest level that any Jew could achieve, higher than a rabbi, higher than a doctor or a lawyer or high tech, is to be a Navi, to be a prophet. We all know that for generations, we strive to reach that high level of prophecy. Now, to be a prophet, you have to, says the Kuzari in source number two, you have to fulfill three criterion. 
and you people seem intelligent enough that you could educated guess. What are the three criterion that you have to fulfill to be a prophet? Yes, you're right. You have to be Jewish. Am Yisrael gets nivuah. But there are a lot of Jews in the world who don't have nivuah because they're not in the land of Israel. The Rambam was a great Jew, but he did not have prophecy because he wasn't in the land of Israel. And where do we learn that? Uh, from the book of Yonah that we're going to read on Yom Kippur, where Jonah does not want to hear a prophecy. And uh, we all know the scenario of a little child who covers his ears and says, I'm not listening. But when God speaks, that doesn't work. And uh, But there is something that works. Yonah hopped on a boat and left the land of Israel in order not to get prophecy. And in order to speak with him, Hashem brought him back to the land of Israel. By the way, the same thing with uh, with uh, only Jews get prophecy. The obvious uh, the obvious exception is Bilam. And Chazal asked, you all know this from Rashi, uh, how did Bilam get prophecy? He's not Jewish. And the answer is, is that the Gentiles were complaining that God only speaks to the Jewish people. And they said, if you give us prophecy, it will be the same thing as we have the Jewish people. And God says, let's try out and sends them Bilam. And we all know the rest of the story where Bilam curses instead of blesses. He doesn't even want to say what God has to has him say. But um, there are 7 million Jews as of this week in Rosh Hashanah, every year in Rosh Hashanah, the Lishkav Statistics, the National Board of Stats, publicizes how many Jews, how many citizens there are in the land of Israel. And we are now 7 million Jews in the land of Israel. And um, out of 7 million Jews, they're all Jewish and they're all in the Holy Land, but I have not heard of any of them being prophets. What are we missing? We're missing a high level of Torah Israel. And that's what the Kuzari says. Let's uh, see it inside together. In source number three. Rabbi Yehuda Levi and Sefer Akuzari in uh, Ma'amar, the second article, 11 and 12. And you all know, remember the background where the king has already converted to Judaism. And most of the book is just questions and answers about Judaism. And Amar HaKuzari, the king, asked the rabbi, Ulam, ani lo shamati ki yesh l'anshe Eretz Yisrael yitaron al shar b'nei adam. You were saying that you can only get prophecy if you're Jewish and if you're in the land of Israel. I have not heard that the Bedouins in the land of Israel get prophecy, or even the Jews in the land of Israel don't get prophecy. Amar HaChaver, the rabbi, answers, Kach gam harchem zeh. The same thing with this mountain. She'atem omrim ki matzliach bo. There is a mountain which is ideal for growing grapes, for making the ideal wine. By the way, Rabbi Yudale did not invent this parable. This is straight from Yeshayahu, chapter Hey. Those who want to look it up, Mashal HaKerem, the parable of the, of the vineyard. That you need all three factors in order to succeed in growing the vineyard. What are the three factors? I have actually, uh, I made up a map here because I don't have a uh, board where you see do you see it straight or do you see it backwards? You see it straight. Okay, I see it backwards. Okay. Um, we see that Am Yisrael is the who. Eretz Yisrael is the where. And Torah Yisrael is the what. Now, if you want to have good grapes, I'm sure all of you have uh, tasted Carmel wine. Carmel wine is not just Israeli wine, which makes it holy, especially during the Shemitah year, where it's doubly holy. But uh, it was a major turning point in Jewish history, because in 1882, when Baron Rothschild bought Bichron Yaakov and Rishon LeZion, why did he choose to buy that land? 
because he sent specialists, wine specialists, and he knew that the Tanakh, the Bible tells us that the land of Israel is very fruitful and especially is good for the seven species. Wine is very good. It makes money. And Baron Rothschild was from France, so he knows a lot about wine. So he sent some specialists to look for the best land, which is conducive for growing wine. So they bought Zichron Yaakov and Rishon Lezion. But that's not enough. Baron Rothschild sent the best vines from France. Um, a lot of people don't know that uh, Carmel wine really began in France. That the vines were imported from France. But that's also not enough. Uh, Lord Rothschild also sent in agricultural specialists who knew how to work the land. Because if you don't have all three factors, it ain't going to grow. You could take the best vines, but plant them in Alaska. It's not going to produce grapes. And you could take the best vines, plant it in the best land. But if you don't know how to work it, it's not going to produce. Similarly, what is the Nimshal, the parable? The nation of Israel and prophecy. Whereas... If you want prophecy, you have to come from good stock. That's Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. That is the Jewish nation. We come from good stock prophets. But that's not enough. You have to plant that vine, that good stock, in good land, which is the land of Israel. And it's not enough if you don't know how to work the land. You don't know how to fertilize, how to water, mineralize, nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you need all three for the vineyard to succeed. And the parallel, again, is Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, and Torah Yisrael. The who, the what, the where, Kedushat Zman, Kedushat Adam, and Kedushat Makom. Now, the, we all know that there are three festivals. Shloshet Regalim. What are the Shloshet Regalim? Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot. And here, I already can see in some of your eyes trying to plug it in. Yeah, it's exactly. Pesach is Am Yisrael. Pesach is the birthday of the nation of Israel. Shavuot is Man Matan Torah Tenu. That's the birthday of the Torah. So that's Am Yisrael, that's Torah Yisrael. So Sukkot, I guess, is Eretz Yisrael. And that's what Rav Kook is going to talk about today. Why is Sukkot Eretz Yisrael? But as always, Rav Kook is solidly based on previous sources. And here the Abar Banel, in source number two, spells it out explicitly. Lama hayor galim shalosh lo pachod velo yoter? Why did God make Three festivals. He could have made two. He could have made four. The Omar Besibadze. The reason it suggests the Abarbanel about 500 years ago. She Yisrael ki blu me'ashemid barach shlosha chasadim gedolim. Because the Jewish people got three great kindness, three great gifts from God. And we want to thank him and we celebrate each and every one of these three gifts. What are the three gifts? The exodus from Egypt, obviously, celebration of Pesach. And then there is Matan Torah, the celebration of the Torah giving. That's obviously Shavuot. Yerushat Aretz, and the inheriting of the land of Israel, the third gift which God gave us, that corresponds to Sukkot. Now that question, why, what is the connection between Chaga Sukkot and Eretz Yisrael? Keep that in the back of your mind. The first most basic answer is that they are both Kedushat Makom, like we said before. The Sukkah is a holy place. The land of Israel is a holy place. But as we'll see, it goes a lot, a lot deeper. All of this is an introduction. Let's go, go to Orota Tshuva. Let's look together in Rav Kook's Orota Tshuva for today. Perik Vav, Piska Zayin, that's source number four where Rav Kook gives a classic poetic parable. Mitzilat Habriah, from the beginning of creation, 
ראוי היה תם העץ להיות גם הוא כטעם פריו. The original plan was that there was supposed to be taste in the tree, just like there is taste in the fruit. In our world, there's just taste in the fruit. But that wasn't the original plan. As we'll see, Rav Cook is going to talk symbolically, and we'll, we'll see a beautiful parable. But where's his source? Most of us remember this from Rashi in elementary school. Source number six, Rashi brings it from the Yalkut Shimoni, where Chazal tell us, desha. on the fourth day of creation, the land produced vegetation. Avra alatsivui. The land did not listen to God. We all know the world was created with 10 sayings. God said, and it was. God said, let there be light, and there was light. But there was one place where God said, and the world did not carry out God's command. God commanded on the fourth day, let there be eight pre ose Fruit trees that produce fruit. Notice, not trees that produce fruit, but fruit trees that produce fruit. What is a fruit tree that produces fruit? God wanted for us to be able to eat the tree just like the fruit, that they taste in the tree just like in the fruit. The land did not listen to God, whatever that means. What does that mean? Land does not have free will. As we'll see, Rav Kook has a beautiful explanation of this Midrash. The symbolism that the land did not listen to God. God said, let there be fruit trees that make fruit. And the land produced trees that make fruit. In our world, it's not like the ideal plan. The ideal world is to be able to eat the trees. In our world, we can eat the fruit, but not the tree. And the question is, what is the symbolism of this Midrash? Maybe just to whet your appetite a little. Some of you may also recall the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah in Source 5, which tells us that there is one fruit that did listen to God. There is one remnant of the ideal world, the etrog. Tanu Rabbanan, pre etz hadar, the fruit of the beautiful tree. Notice, the etrog is not called the beautiful fruit. It's called the fruit of the beautiful tree. It's shetam etzo upirio shave, heve omer ze etrog. The etrog, how do we know it's the etrog? Because it's the fruit of the beautiful tree. What is the fruit of the beautiful tree? For that not only the fruit is beautiful, but the tree is beautiful, that the tree has taste just like in the fruit, just like the world was supposed to be originally. And we're beginning to see the developing of how the holiday of Sukkot, with the etrog as the central of the four species, is to remind us that the ideal world has taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. What is the symbolism? Let's go back to Rav Kook and try and understand what Sukkot is trying to teach us. And what does it mean that the ideal world is that there is taste in the tree, just like in the fruit? And also always remember that third question, first question, um, why is Sukkot in the Abarbanel parallel to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel. Rav Kook continues. Again, the world was supposed to be in the beginning of creation, that we could have taste in the tree just like in the fruit. Here is the symbolism. All of the means that hold some kind of lofty spiritual goal, Hayu 
Rav Cook explains that the tree symbolizes the medium, the means. The fruit is the goal. When we plant an apple tree, the goal is apples. If I want a good wood, I'll plant something else. But when you plant an olive tree, the goal is the olives, the fruit. And here Rav Cook raises a very interesting question. Some of you people might, may remember George Burns, the comedian, Jewish comedian. And in the 70s, there was a uh, movie, uh, Oh God, where George Burns plays God. I see some of you remember that. And uh, obviously, it's a, it's a parody. It's a joke. And um, the interviewer, John Denver, asked uh, God, George Burns, God, did you ever make a mistake? And God says, Mr. Burns, George Burns says, uh, yeah, I think I made the seed of the avocado too large. Now, obviously, God doesn't make mistakes. And who knows, maybe in the olden days, the first round ball that they used to play before there was Wilson tennis balls was maybe they used to play with avocado pits because they're big and round. Anyway, um, Rav Cook is basically asking the same question on God. Um, God, why did you create in every tree so much tree? and so little fruit. All right, I have in my uh, backyard 15 fruit trees. And uh, I mentioned to Dufkin last year that when I was planting the trees, my friend, the farmer, explained that you have to distance three meters between each tree to make sure that they don't steal from each other minerals, water, sunlight. And um, my friend, the farmer, explained to me that what you see above ground, that's what's going down also beneath the ground. So if a tree is 20 feet high, it also has 20 feet of roots, which means he needs a lot of room. Now, if you think about it, after a 20 feet tall tree, okay? He's got 20 feet of roots. He's got 20 feet of trunk. He's got a lot of branches and leaves. Until you finally get to the apples, more than 90% of the tree is tree, not fruit. Right? You all see the, 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 the question? And it's interesting that God made it that way. And Rav Kook explains here that that's all of life. This really helps us understand life. Because more than 90% of life is preparation, is to prepare for is the means. And you know what? A lot of people in life never even get to the end. They never get to the fruit. They never fulfill their dreams. Does that mean that they wasted their life? Rav Kook is dealing here with a very existential question. If 90% of life is preparation, is waking up, getting dressed. There's no ideal in getting dressed. There's no ideal in waking up. There's no ideal in eating breakfast. There's no ideal in going to work. There's no ideal in eating lunch. There's no ideal in traveling back home. There's no ideal in eating supper. There's no ideal in checking your email. Where is the taste in life? If everything is a preparation, if you just think, if you have children, right? There's so much preparation and nine months of pregnancy and buying everything that they need and all of the backache and heartburn, and nursing, and not nursing, and bringing him to the doctor, and bringing him to, to camp, and bringing him to school, and going to the principal, and parent-teachers meetings, and there is so much preparation. And what happens if chas uh, a child dies at the age of 18? Does that mean that you wasted 18 years because you just had a tree and you never got to the fruit? Or of Cook again is saying that if 90% of life is tree, again, the roots, the trunk, the branches, the le if 90% of life is tree, is preparation, and if I want to have taste in life, meaning in life, I have no choice but to try and find a way to bring meaning 
face into the tree and not just in the fruit. Because a lot of time we never get to the fruit. And this is especially, especially applicable to the holiday of Sukkot, whereas we see the Etrog is the last remnant of the ideal world, which by the way, I gave a lecture on this last week, and I actually brought in a branch of a citrus tree, and uh, I passed it around, and people, you could actually, it's not good to taste, because there's a very bitter aftertaste, but it has, it's enough, you could just smell you the fragrance of the citrus trees, like the etrog tree, has the same smell as the fruit. As so, what is the symbolism here in Chaga Asit? Chaga Sukkot is the holiday of we already gathered in the fruit in the land of Israel. The fruit it ripens in the summer. Dates. Look at the seven species. The figs are already finished. The dates are finishing up now. Olives are beginning to ripen. Grapes are finished ripening. And um, this is the time that we celebrate and thank God for everything that he gave us. But what if there was a drought and there was no fruit? Does that mean that I wasted a year? Because again, the Tanakh is addressing usually an agricultural society. The entire agricultural year is planting, it's plowing, watering, fertilizing, pruning, weeding. The entire year you're working for the fruit. And what happens if there's no fruit? Again, if the tree is just tree, just preparation, and there's no taste in the tree, then you wasted the year. So how can we find a way to bring taste into our mundane secular, menial, day-to-day -day lives after Rosh Hashanah, after Yom Kippur. How do we continue? That's what Sukkot is here to teach us. Let's see it in the Gra. The Vilna Gon, the Gra, um, I think we may have mentioned that there is a direct line between Rav Kook and the Vilna Gon. The Rav Kook or the, he learned his Rebbe was the Netziv, was the Rosh Hashiv of Velazhin, who learned from Rabbi Yitzchak of Velazhin, who learned from Rabbi Chaim Velazhin, who learned from the Vilna Gon. So there is a significant amount of Rav Kook's Torah, which comes directly from the Vilna Gon. And here we'll see a beautiful example. The Vilna Gon spells it out for us in source number 13. There are only two mitzvot that a person enters with all of his very body, with all of his being. The only two mitzvot that a person can fulfill, even when he's in a coma, is living in a sukkah during those seven days, or living all year in the land of Israel. Sukkah is like a microcosm of the land of Israel. The Gra learns it out from a pasuk in Tehilim. It should say vayihi. God's sukkah, his home, is in Zion, is in Eretz Yisrael. What is the Vilna Gon saying? I had a good friend on our Yishuv, where I live in Kol Shachar, who uh, did a very stupid thing. And I'll just say that it's really stupid to make sure that nobody uh, makes the same mistake. He drove a dune buggy uh, without a helmet, and he flipped over, and got a knock on the head, and he was in a coma for like seven years. And then he passed away. And it was such a tragedy because his name was Chaim Sorek, very active. He grew up on a kibbutz. And uh, he was super energetic. 
And he was always active in this mitzvah, in that action, and working the land. In the... And when you would see him just laying in his wheelchair with his eyes open, and he can't do anything, no expression. And one Sukkot, I was walking with my wife around on Yom Tov, and we saw his son wheel Chaim into the sukkah in his wheelchair. And I looked at his son, and my eyes met his eyes. You know, sometimes that happens that your eyes meet with someone and you know that you're both thinking the same thought. And then he spelled it out. Finally, there's a mitzvah that my father can still do as he wheels him into a sukkah. And I corrected him that the Vilna Gon says that living in the land of Israel is just like living in a sukkah. During the seven days of Sukkot, how do you fulfill the mitzvah? You eat in a sukkah, you sleep in a sukkah, you could twiddle your thumbs in a sukkah, you could play with your cell phone in a sukkah, you could sleep in a sukkah, you could be in a coma in a sukkah. Somebody asked about kavana, about intentions. Obviously, there, it is more of a mitzvah if you have intention to do the mitzvah. For example, on Shabbat, if you have intention that I'm making Kiddush and observing Shabbat, Zecher Litziat Mitzrayim, Zecher L'maseh Breshit, in memory of the Exodus, in memory of the creation, obviously that's on a higher level. But I imagine very few people really focus and think about that all Shabbat. Nevertheless, Shabbat is a mitzvah. The more intention they have, the better. But if a person's in a coma and you wheel him into a sukkah, every second that he is there, he is doing a mitzvah. And the same thing with somebody who lives their whole life in Eretz Yisrael. When you plant a tree in Eretz Yisrael, it's a mitzvah. Do you know that if you walk four steps in Eretz Yisrael, it's a mitzvah? The language in Eretz Yisrael, Lashon Kodesh, is the holy language. So it's not secular. It is holy. Corona raised an interesting problem. I don't know, uh, I'm sure some of you have the custom of kissing the mezuzah when you go into a door. And the rabbi said, no, with Corona, you shouldn't kiss mezuzot anymore. But uh, when someone's in the land of Israel, you can kiss the door post, you can kiss the wall, you can kiss the floor, you can kiss, because everything is holy. The rocks are holy, the land is holy. Even the money is holy. The money is called shekel hakodesh, the holy shekel. And here we're beginning to understand that the ideal life of a Jew has taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. All right, usually, if I were to ask you, is walking tree or fruit? Is it a means or is it the end? Everybody would say walking is a means of getting from here to there, of going from Minsk to Pinsk. Um, but in the land of Israel, even if you're just walking around in circles, the Mishnah Barah brings at the beginning of Hilchot Shabbat that there is a mitzvah to walk four steps in the land of Israel. So even if you're not walking anywhere, there is taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. The same thing in the language. If I were to ask you, is speaking a tree or is it fruit? Is it preparation? Is it a means? No, everybody would say, no, it's, uh, it's it, I'm saying, it's not fruit, it's a mean. It's a way to convey an idea. But I know some people like talking a lot, but I don't think anybody sees an ideal in saying as many words as he can. Um, in Eretz Yisrael, where the holy language is the land, is the language of the land, every word that you say in Hebrew is a mitzvah. And if anybody wants to see the sources on it, um, oh, actually we did in the previous series on religious Zionism. Somebody, some of you were here. If you missed the series, uh, I wrote a book called Laharimet Degel uh, with uh, 200 page, pages on the mitzvah of speaking Hebrew. Whereas if you wanna tell a joke, telling a joke is not an ideal, but it's tree. It's a means to be happy. Talking about the sports, talking about the weather, talking about a recipe. Speaking is not fruit. It's not an ideal. But 
if it is Lashon HaKodesh, the Hebrew language, it is an idea. Now, obviously, if you learn Torah or you speak ideology in the, in the holy language, it's a double ideal. Just like if a person is in a sukkah in the land of Israel, where every single second is clicking up, bing, 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 two mitzvot say da'oraita every single second, even if you're in a coma. The Khatam Sofer says that when a person lives in the land of Israel, he is on a different planet. He is on a planet of holiness, where everything is holy. And if so, even if I plant a tree and it doesn't produce fruit, the tree has taste, just like the fruit. And if I work all year round and plant and plow and fertilize and water, et cetera, et cetera, and say in the end there's no fruit, I have not wasted a year. Because in the land of Israel, working the holy land is a mitzvah. And now we're beginning to understand what is the ideal life. When God wanted to create the world in a way that there be taste in the tree, just like in the fruit, what's the ideal? That every time I change a diaper, every time I cook a meal, every time I go to work, there is an ideal there. There is meaning there. Even if a person is a millionaire, the Khatam Sofer brings down, you know, well, I think we'll see it inside. We're running out of time. Oh, no. Maybe we won't see it inside. The Khatam Sofer uh, brings down in source number 23 that working the land in itself is an ideal. And he brings, he learns it out from Boaz. You remember Boaz in the book of Ruth? Boaz, according to Chazal, the Talmud, Tell, it tells us he was the head of the Sanhedrin. He was the chief rabbi. So he was very busy during the day. So now I begin to understand why does he meet Ruth at night in the silo? Well, maybe because he's too busy during the day and he has to work for a living. But that can't be because the Khatam Sofer points out that Boaz is a multimillionaire. Everybody comes to work in his field. He leaves the leket chikan peyah, the extra grain, for the poor people. So if so, if he's so wealthy, why is he working at night in the fields? Explains the Chatam Sofer. Mishum mitzvah yishuv eretz Yisrael. To work the land of Israel and to produce her holy fruit. And even if you don't produce any fruit, the work itself is holy. And even if a person is a multimillionaire, he should not just retire and play tennis or play mahjong or jin. He should continue working. He could, should continue learning. He should continue being active because we don't just work for a living, especially in the land of Israel, but really anywhere in the world. The idea is that there be taste in the tree, in the preparation, just like in the fruit. Rav Cook points out in Source 21, that this is the essence of the nation of Israel. Hayesod Roshi, the most basic center of culture of life, Kaklaut, agriculture. Halohi Amim Ragoreim Kalkali Chiyuni Pashut. For all other nations, they just work the land in order to produce fruit, in order to eat, in order to live. So that it's really tree, it's all preparation. But where is the taste in life? Where's your ideal? But the topic of the Jewish people is the Holy of Holies. What is the Holy of Holies? What is inside the Holy of Holies? The Kruvim. Two golden idols, a male and a female, hugging each other. The most physical description that you could imagine. But that is Holy of Holies. Holy of holies. The most holy thing is that when you find godliness and meaning and taste in the tree, in the secular, in the preparation. Everything that touches the people of Israel is holy. Now this brings us to a very important point about understanding the holiday of Sukkot. The holiday of Sukkot, we all remember that the Mishnah tells us of the Simchat Beit HaShoeva. 
there was a special party that went on in the Beit HaMikdash. There was a circus going on in the Holy Temple in Yerushalayim. Now, what was the circus about? It was called Simchat Beit HaShoeva, the festivities of the drawing of the water. And Rav Kook asked the obvious question. There's no mitzvah to draw the water. What is the mitzvah? To pour the water on the altar. What is drawing the water outside of Yerushalayim? It's just a what? Just a preparation. But the holiday of Sukkot comes to teach us that there's no such thing as just a preparation. Because without the tree, there's no fruit. And 90% of life is the mundane, is the secular. And when you draw the holy water, that also is a mitzvah. And that's why it's called Simchat Beit HaShoeva, the festivities of the drawing of the water, not the pouring of the water. Now, what was the festivities about? So the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah uh, gives us a tachlis, an example. Here we go. The Gemara Masechet Sukkah talks about how Rabbon Shimon ben Gamliel, verse 11. In Masechet Sukkot, Davnun Gimel what would he do at this party in the holiday of Sukkot in the Holy Temple in Yerushalayim? Amru alav Rabbon Shimon ben Gamliel, kshaya sameach simchat beit ha-shoeva, hayan notel shmone avukot shel ur. He would take eight burning torches, v'zorek echad, v'notel echad, v'ein no god zo bezu. What is this called in English? Juggling. By the way, when I prepared the class, I checked in the Guinness Book of World Records. What is the world rec record for juggling burning torches? Seven. Rabbi Shum ben Gamliel juggled eight. Now, if you think about it, it takes a lot of practice. I thought he's the chief rabbi. Since when does he have time to practice juggling burning torches? And doesn't that seem sacrilegious? And not only that, Gamliel used to put on acrobatics. He would bend over without bending his knees, put his thumbs on the ground, kiss the ground, and stand back up. Nobody else could do that acrobatics. And if you think about it, again, the obvious question, that doesn't sound very religious to have a circus and to have the chief rabbi putting on acrobatics and breaking Guinness Book of World Records as if it's some kind of ideal to juggle. Now you understand. Because the holiday of Sukkot is to teach us that there's nothing wrong with juggling. As a matter of fact, there is taste in the tree just like in the fruit. Juggling could be mundane and secular, but if you're doing it in the right time, in the right place, it's holy. And that is the chidush of the land of Israel, and that is the chidush of the idea of Sukkot. Let's go on. The Talmud Yerushalmi. I'm sure many of you people know that when we cite the Talmud, we're usually citing the Talmud Bavli. But there's also a Talmud Yerushalmi. And there are a lot of reasons why we learn more Bavli than Yerushalmi. It was written later, and it's a lot sharper. Nevertheless, um, now that modern man has developed, and especially we are returning to the land of Israel, we are now ready for the Hashkafa of the Talmud Yerushalmi. The Talmud Yerushalmi has a different philosophy of Judaism. Let's see it inside. Source 17, the Talmud Yerushalmi, Masachet Nidarim, talks about what is Nidarim? People take oaths. If a person is in trouble and he'll take an oath, God, if you get me out of this, I'll give a thousand shekel to tzedakah. If you give me a child, I will give this, or I will refrain from drinking wine, or I will refrain from this, or that's what Masachet Nidarim is about. The Talmud Yerushalmi, notice, this is not in the Babylonian Talmud, only in the Israeli Talmud does it say 
לא דייך מה שאסרה תורה, אלא שאתה מבקש לאסור עליך דברים אחרים? The Talmud Yerushalmi is not in favor of somebody separating himself from physical pleasure. Right? In the land of Israel, physical pleasure is holy. The apples are holy. Going to work is holy. Even your circus can be holy. Your language is holy. And that's why the Talmud Yerushalmi does not say stay away from physical pleasure. In Babel, outside of the land of Israel, physical pleasure is more dangerous. Very often it comes at the expense of spirituality. But the ideal life is that even the secular, the physical, have taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. And that there's no such thing as secular. That there's no such thing as just a preparation. Similarly, the Talmud Yerushalmi again in Source 18 in Masechet Kiddushin, in the fourth chapter, tells us that when we go up to heaven, This is a very famous line, but you'll only find it in the Talmud Yerushalmi. That when a person, after 120, goes up to heaven, on the entrance exam into heaven, God is going to ask him, did you enjoy every pleasure that God created? Now, my cousins who live in Borough Park or Williamsburg, there, the more somebody refrains from the physical world, he just learns Torah all day. He doesn't work. He doesn't go to the army. He doesn't write poetry. He doesn't play tennis. He, he is seen as something more spiritual. But that is not the ideal Torah. If you look back in the Tanakh, all of the heroes of the Tanakh, from Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe Rabbeinu, David HaMelech, they all worked the land, and they all served in the army, and they were all well-rounded people. The picture of the ideal Jew got warped during 2,000 years of exile. Why? Like the Chatham Sofer says, why does he just sit and learn Torah? Why doesn't he work the land? Why doesn't he serve in the army? He answers, because I live in Pressburg. Because if I'm living in Chutzlaret, I want to invest in spirituality. And the more I invest in the physical, I'm endangering my spirituality. If you go to university, that is endangering your spirituality, unless it's a Jewish university. And that is part of the beauty of the land of Israel. And this is the Ashkafa, which modern man is ready for. By the way, Rav Shinshin Raphael Hirsch did not live in the land of Israel. Nevertheless, on this issue, he is very much in line with Rav Kook. Because today, even somebody who's living in Toronto can understand that we have matured and are ready to reveal godliness in the mundane world. And that's what original Judaism is. And this, Davka is connected. I just turn off my phone. This is directly connected with the definition of Kedusha. What is holiness? Let's look together in Ramosha Chaim Lutzato in Source 15, the Ramchal and Sefer Mesilat Yesharim, the path of the just, where Ramosha Chaim Lutzato, or running out of time, do this orally. He explains what is the difference between Tahara and Kedusha. Tahara, he explains, is a lower level. Tahara is somebody who stays away from the physical world, locks himself in the yeshiva, in order to keep his spirituality on a high level. That's a tahor, a pure person. But somebody who is kadosh, he's on a higher level. Kidusha is to reveal godliness even in the mundane, even in the secular. That there is taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. By the way, again, we don't have time to see it inside, but in source 14, if you're interested, Tosot de Masechem and Achot brings an interesting machloket, difference of opinion between the Talmud Bavli and the Talmud Yerushalmi on preparation. Is preparing a mitzvah a mitzvah? Is building a sukkah a mitzvah? Is tying tzitzit a mitzvah? Is writing a mezuzah a mitzvah? You take an educated guess. Yes, the Talmud Yerushalmi says the preparation is a mitzvah. The Talmud Bavli, which was written outside of the land of Israel, says no. There is no taste in the tree, just 
in the fruit. Interesting. The Navi Zechariah, which is the Haftarah that we read on Shabbat Cholamoid Sukkot, in chapter 14 in Zechariah, it, teach, it tells us, it's source uh, 14 in the sheet, source 10, sorry, that the entrance exam for Gentiles into the world to come is will they celebrate the holiday of Sukkot? It's interesting. I would have thought that if God wants to test the Gentiles, give them a difficult test, right? We've been working for 613 mitzvot for 3,000 years. We work pretty hard. They just have said it. If they want to get into Yemot Mashiach, God should give them a difficult test. Why is Sukkot the test that who's ever in the Sukkot will be in also in the days of Messiah? And just to strengthen the question, sitting in the Sukkot, we said before, is the easiest mitzvah. Why does God give the Gentiles such an easy mitzvah? That's the test. And not only that, the Talmud of Masechet Abu Dazara Dav Gimel says that most of the Gentiles will fail the test. All right, what's so difficult about eating and drinking and sleeping in a sukkah? But if you understand the difference between Tahran and Kedusha, you understand. When a person wants to be an ideal Catholic, a priest, he has to swear chastity, poverty, and obedience. He is not allowed to derive physical pleasure from the opposite sex. He's not allowed to, allowed to make his own money, poverty. Why? Because they believe in Tahara. And by the way, this is the difference between Yom Kippur and Sukkot. Rav Kuk goes on to tell us that what is the last mitzvah in the laws of Yom Kippur? After you break your fast. Go and build a sukkah. Why is building a sukkah, which is just a preparation, why is that the last halakha in, in the laws of Yom Kippur? Rav Kook explains that Yom Kippur is shock treatment. When a person eats poison, when a person has a heart attack, you give them shock treatment to bring them back to life. On Yom Kippur, we pretend that we're angels. We totally separate ourselves from physical pleasure. We're on a level of purity, not on a level of holiness. Rav Kook tells us that you cannot live your life on chakri. Yom Kippur, we pretend to be angels. But the last halakha of Yom Kippur is go build a sukkah. Go back to life. Buy a beautiful lulav. Buy a beautiful etrog. Decorate your sukkah. There's nothing wrong with physical beauty. As a matter of fact, the Gemara, when it talks about the importance of Hidur Mitzvah, notice Hidur, Hadar, Priyat, Sadar, it learns the halachot of physical beauty, first and foremost, from the Sukkah and the Lulav and Atrog. And there's no mitzvot that we examine the physical beauty so much like the Atrog. And no mitzvah that we decorate so much like the Sukkah. Even so, even more so, the Torah tells us on Sukkah, the mitzvah is ta'asu. And by kete, make it. And by lulav and etrog, ulekachtem, to take it. All right, taking and making is just preparation. You all see that? Sukkot comes to teach us that there is nothing wrong with preparation. Most of life is preparation. And there's nothing wrong with physical beauty as long as you do it in the right time in the right place. There's nothing wrong with having a circus, even in the Holy of Holies. And this is why this is the test for the Gentile. Because if a Gentile, if God would have asked them to fast on Yom Kippur, they all would have passed the test. Why? Because that's the level of Tahra, which is the level of the Talmud Bavi. On the other hand, we today are ready for a higher level. The level of modern orthodoxy, of religious Zionism, is the level of kedusha of holiness, to reveal godliness even in the secular, to have taste not just in the fruit, but also in the tree. That is the level of the Talmud Yerushalmi. That is the level of kedusha, And that is why, says the Kuzari, why there are 52 Shabbatot and a lot of holidays where we enjoy physical pleasure, as opposed to only one Yom Kippur. Because the main idea of Judaism is Kedusha.
not just tahara. Enjoy life, enjoy God's world in the right time, in the right place. And that is what we strive to return to the level of the etrog, the level of tasting in the tree, just like in the fruit. Because again, 90% of life, if not more, is preparation. And in the holiday of gathering the fruit, we remember that this isn't what it's all about. That the entire year of planting and plowing and changing diapers and preparing computer programs and working, all of that, yes, it is mundane. Yes, it is secular. But real Judaism says reveal godliness in Am Yisrael, in Eretz Yisrael, and in Torah Yisrael. The ideal who, the ideal what, and the ideal where. And now you understand that if Pesach is Am Yisrael, Shavuot is the Torah, now you understand why Sukkah is Eretz Yisrael. That it is a microcosm of Eretz Yisrael, just like the Etrog is a microcosm of Eretz Yisrael. Of the ideal world, of taste the, in the tree, just like in the fruit. Taste in the preparation, not just in the goal. We wish all of you a Gemar Chatima Tova. And uh, like we said, even more important, uh, happy uh, Sukkot. Uh, it's interesting. I, uh, the shofar, the, the Talmud says that the more bent a shofar is, the more it's bent over, the better. A lulav, on the other hand, if it's bent, is not kosher. Because a lulav has to be upright, straight, proud. Okay. So it was a pleasure uh, finishing off the series. We'll get to the chats. Get to the comments. Oh, the first one is from Sharon, a 150, 850, I think. Uh, that, rabbi Kelman, you're the rabbi of a worldwide show. That was for uh, you. That, that's, uh, no, but in terms of questions on your shear, go down to, to Sharon's at 150, 850, where you are. Why did Hashem make man out of something that didn't obey him? The earth. The... Is it down? In other words, why, why, why is it that the earth didn't obey God? Like, it's not like oh. man. The earth doesn't have free choice, you know? Ah, okay. So this Midrash, like most Midrashim, is symbolic. And the idea, the symbolism is what we explain. That the world is, as Rav Cook says, in its physical state, it's mostly tree. And there's not that much tree in the menial part of life. And it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort until we advance and evolve that evolution to where we're at today, that we're supposed to reveal godliness also in the secular, especially in the land of Israel. That's what the land of Israel is about. Okay. Is there Hi, not? Can I say something? It's Sharon. Um, the yes. reason why that the earth was cursed is Rashi talks about it all the time, that the earth was cursed because it did not obey. Hashem said, it's pre or separate and it's right. not necessarily homiletic but it was an actual thing but when Kaddish Baruch Hu created man he chose that material that had a problem already there was a problem in that okay so that's the answer what Rav Kook what we learned tonight is an in, the entire shira was an answer to your question which we saw in the Yalkut Shimoni Rashi is quoting source number four that we saw where the Yalkut Shimoni brings that Midrash which again is very weird, hard to understand because the land does not have free will. And what Rav Kook is explaining the symbolism of that Midrash is that at first, the land is not going to obey, but the day will come where the land will obey because this ongoing process of revealing the godliness in Kedusha and not just in Tahara, that's what life is about. That's why the etrog symbolizes the re last remnant of the ideal world. That's, that's exactly what the Hour of Cook is explaining the Midrash. It's not meant to be taken literally, like most Midrashim. Okay, is Zelat or Tel Aviv part of the ideal land of Israel? First Commonwealth Temple or second Commonwealth Temple, boundary of the borders of the is your definition of Torah, a particular Hasidic or United group. Okay, that's a very general question. Um, but uh, regarding the land of Israel, land of Israel 
wherever the people of Israel declare as the land of Israel, that's included. So it's included in Eilat. Now, your question about Tel Aviv, which I imagine is asking about, isn't Tel Aviv a relatively secular place? Uh, the answer is, in the land of Israel, uh, there are different levels. And yes, Yerushalayim is on a higher level. And the more mitzvot a people does, and the more Shabbat we observe, and the more kashrut we observe, the more holiness there is. But the holiness of Tel Aviv is not dependent on whether the Jews are religious or not. By the way, there are probably more religious Jews in Tel Aviv probably than uh, in uh, just about any city in the world. But uh, that's aside from the point. Um, and the same thing regarding the borders. Wherever Am Yisrael declares the borders, uh, that is the land of Israel. Now, the borders of Yotzei Mitzrayim, that well, we don't have time to get into Kitzel Hazeshatav, Kitzel Atid Lavo. The kids are there different levels, but in the end, um, all of the promised land uh, from Nachal Mitzrayim to Narprat is uh, holy and will be belong to the land of Israel. What is the definition of Torah? Hasidic or Mitnagdit? Well, that we already learned together that it is also Hasidic, and also Misnag, and also Breslev, and also Lubavitch, and as Rav Kook says, you have to take the positive ideology from each and every group and learn love of Israel from Lubavitch, learn happiness from Breslev, learn love of Israel from the Zionists, learn love of mankind from the socialists, right? They're all right, and that is the complete Torah. If somebody's broad enough, that's what we should aim for. The least, tolerate the other groups and encourage them. Okay, I thought Chazal declared that the time of prophecy has ended. In its time, they said that it ended. Um, the Rambam in uh, Moren Vuchim says that today, he doesn't talk about today, but he says when the Jewish people show Gevura to save Am Yisrael, that is the first level of prophecy. So according to the Rambam, there is prophecy today in uh, the Israeli Defense Force. But uh, prophecy as we know it, we don't have, but we hope it's going to return on the higher level. Here's the sources, the latest URL. Uh, doesn't have time, the ability. Doesn't time have the ability to improve some or most stock? Yeah, they obviously the different factors interact with each other, right? A good tree will produce in Alaska better than a bad tree, right? Uh, like we said a minute ago, why not have all? Am Yisrael, in the land of Israel, observing the Torah of Israel, have it all. Just like you don't just put on a tefillin on your hand, you should also put on your head. Both are important. The Torah in general is a package deal. Radzi the Kuk used to say on the Pasuk, Torah Tashem Tmima Meshivat Nafesh, that when the Torah is complete, it revives our soul. And the problem is, if people just take a part of the Torah and focus on just on that part and maybe even put down the other groups, then they're not uh, enjoying the full Torah. The full Torah is everything because everything was created by the same God. Isn't Shavuot more aligned with Yerushat Aretz? No, Shavuot was the holiday of the giving of the Torah. So that's why it's the birthday of Torah Israel. But not- By the way, there's- Am Yisrael in all three, there's Eretz Yisrael in all three, and there's Torah Yisrael in all three. But if you're to objectively look at what is the most important aspect of Pesach, it's the exodus of the Jewish people. The most important aspect of Shavuot is the giving of the Torah. Isn't that post? Uh, that's uh, for the Galut. But, uh, but, but in the Torah, isn't Shavuot, it's the uh, Bikurim and the the vidoy of the, the farmer who comes and says, this is why we are here. Correct. But there's also Pesach. Pesach is also Chaga Aviv. Pesach is also in the land of Israel. Every holiday also has an agricultural or national side, also a historical side, also a godly spiritual side. But uh, the, the, the point is, what is the main focus of each of them? I think everyone would agree if I were just to take even a 10 year old and ask him, what's Shavuot about? He would say the Torah. But you're definitely right that today outside of the land of Israel, especially if we don't uh, 
have the Beit HaMikdash, we are missing a lot of Shavuot, and also a lot about Pesach, and also a lot about Sukkot. We're missing most of the mitzvot, as a matter of fact. A um, more modern take is Evan Almighty. I guess that's a modern version of Oh God. Okay, I'll look it up afterwards on the Wikipedia. I like this group. It always gives me homework. I have to, uh, I've been away from America for 40 years. and uh, That's when my uh, knowledge of Hollywood stopped. In coma, how can you have intentionality? Again, different levels. The more you have kavana, the Kabbalistic intentions when you shake a lulav and etrog, the better. If you think about the different directions of the world, the better. If you just think it's a mitzvah of God, that's also good. But even if you're just shaking it, it's still a mitzvah. And the uh, lichatrila mitzvot do need kavana. But even if they don't have the intention, like I said before, I imagine most people don't really focus every Shabbat that it is in memory of the creation of the world and in memory of the exodus. We should. And so too regarding Sukkah, and so too regarding Eretz Yisrael. Have as much kavana, the more the better. Frozen. But I, was I frozen for a while? Okay, mine is fine. That's what it sounds like. Implications of this. Bring all Jewish coma patients to Israel. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, why not bring all Jews to Israel, including all the coma patients? Oh, Stephen asked in Hebrew. Um, you can uh, write me in chat your address and I'll be happy to send you a copy. It costs uh, 50 shekel. I don't know what that is in, uh, in English, but uh, might be in Israel also. I don't know. But uh, anyway, whoever wants a copy of my book, it's uh, it was 50 shekels, like uh, $15 or something like that. Uh, so you can write me at the end of the chat. Yeah, this is a good time because this is our last uh, class of the series. Um, I guess this is a good time to post the link to register for the Shior Bifri. Okay. Who drew the water outside of Jerusalem? The Kohanim would draw the water. And uh, Dafka, it's, uh, it's an unbelievable question that I never saw anybody ask before Rav Kook, but it really fits into everything else that he says about the holiday of Sukkot, that it's a preparation. And why did Hashem make man out of something that didn't obey him? The earth. Okay. That's an interesting question. I imagine that Rav Kook would say that, just like we learned today, that the essence of life is not the land, and it's not the vegetation. The essence of life is man, is life. And man is meant to learn from the land that we should keep in mind that eventually have taste in the tree, just like in the fruit. Again, taste in the secular, just like in the holy. Hi, can I just uh, thank you? I love you, Shiram. They're, it's, they're amazing. But I, the question is really the material. Um, as an artist, or as an art teacher, if I'm using a material that's going to smash, if, if I use glass and I drop it, it's gonna break. If I use a different material and something happens, then it's not gonna break as, as easily. I always assumed that Kaddish Baruch Hu made man out of the earth, which did not obey. So in case they didn't listen, then Kaddish Baruch would say, well, I made it out of something that didn't obey me. Therefore, you know, it gives a pit on pad that, that I could find an excuse to, to forgive them. But if, why right. would Kaddish, why would Kaddish Baruch Hu take something to make man out of a material that already has shown not a hundred percent obedience? Because that's I, what man is about. Man also inevitably is not o always going to be. But obedient. maybe, maybe if Kaddish Baruch had used a material that hadn't, maybe he would have been strong enough to withstand the temptation of of, so, of Gan Eden. But what Rav Cook is doing, uh, Rav Cook, as is often the case, is extremely innovative, and he's going Pashut in a totally different direction. And by the way, most Midrashim are not meant to be taken literally. The whole idea is to understand the symbolism. But uh, what I, I grew Rav up, is suggesting I grew here, up on, on, on Drash before I knew Pshat. My home, I was brought up in Drash. I was, you know, um, I know Alan Schwartz, Rabbi Alan Schwartz, but we have had many yeah. discussions of, of you know, um, the Midrash. And, and I was brought up, as I said, even before Pshat, you know, um, 
the Medrash mm -hmm. was the, the Iker. And I understand that there are things to learn from it, but there's yep. a Kedusha of the Drash. And I think that, that there's something very basic in this whole concept of the material man was made out of. And I just, I find but, but, but the way Rav Cook looks at it is that yeah. everything is important. Just like we said before, every single topic is important. Every stream in Judaism, every stream in every ideology in the world is important. Okay. Similarly, when you learn Pshat, you have to learn Pshat. When you learn Drash, you learn Drash. And Drash is not meant to be taken literally. And uh, again, the Maral, the Rambam, everybody writes about that. I know, I know, that doesn't mean that it's not important. Yeah, Adarabah, it's extremely important. But as a matter of fact, personally, I enjoy learning Midrash even more than Pshat, but that only on the condition that you're learning the symbolism and the higher meaning of the Midrash. That's really what we tried to do today. But uh, let's go on because there are other uh, comments here. But again, the, the idea is, is that man is typified by the earth Dafka because the earth had fr as if it were free will not to listen to God. And that's what life is about, that we have free will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. And... <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful. We really, really enjoyed oh. it so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Mamash, my pleasure. This is akin to rising to heaven and Hashem asking, so did you see my Alps? Oh, so uh, that famous saying is really taken from this Yerushalmi that we saw inside. But as you saw, the Tamil Yerushalmi doesn't talk about the Alps. Um, the Alps are very good for uh, maybe to go and visit, but uh, Jews are meant to live in the land of Israel, not in the Alps. Today, actually, you can uh, enjoy the whole world on the internet. I think maybe in Corona, that's, uh, what, that's what we're doing anyway. Um, Rabbi? Yeah. I, I have to leave. You can stay on ask questions, but I have actually a school meeting. It's their first day of school. And so I'm going to go. You, and you can stay on answer the question. I just want to thank you. Wish you Gamar Khatimatova. Wish everybody well. And like I mentioned, our next year is tomorrow, 930. Our partial instead of tonight will be tomorrow. I'm going to give it in the time slot I usually use for Pekeput. Shemitah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. So we hope to see you. I'm going to make you host, Rabbi. And then when you leave, it will... Um, and you, and you know, when you end the thing, that then it'll the automatically report. end because you'll okay. you're, you'll be the host now. Okay, sorry, okay. but I, you know, stay on and everybody be well. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll just finish up the questions. And why did God create the woman from a bone from Adam? Well, that's a big, uh, important topic in and to itself. And in the two minutes that uh, we're way over time, uh, we're not going to have. Thank you so much, Rabbi Shvat. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you for your thank you. Uh, thank to everybody. Nifla, lovely and elevating. Wow. These are the best comments at the end. Thank you so much. Extremely interesting and thought provoking. Ah, okay. You did Barsky at Gmail. Okay. So I take it you want the Sefer uh, Larima Tadegel. It's about, it's half about the flag of Israel the Israeli flag in the sources, and the other half, the last 200 pages are about the Hebrew language. But I'll copy your uh, email and I'll ask you for your address. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, we'll send it out to you as soon as possible. Okay. Be well, everyone. Have a Gmar Chatima Tova. And Bezrat Hashem, we'll get to meet each other in another important series in Torah in Motion. Shalom, shalom.